Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Really excited for today's virtual field trip. We are heading out on board the exploration vessel Nautilus. But before we go there and meet the team, I want to take a quick second, uh, share my screen. We're going to take a look at National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive to get a feel uh, for everyone's joining us live from today. So it should just take a second to pop up here. All right, there we go. So I am here in Canada in Alora, Ontario. And if I start to back up from the red X, you can see we've got a classroom joining us in Toronto, Ontario. And if we go back a little bit further, you can see we have classrooms, a couple classrooms from New Jersey joining us, another classroom in Indiana. Move a little bit south, we've got a classroom joining us in North Carolina. And if we head over, we've got a couple classrooms hanging out with us from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, so lots of classrooms as well. Another classroom in Washington State. And roughly where this little ship icon is, is where we have the exploration uh, vessel Nautilus today. So as I come back from that screen share, I want to give a shout out to any classrooms who are tuning in live via YouTube today. Don't forget, you can still get in on the action. Chat sidebar on the right. Let us know who you are and where you're watching from. Send us in some of those questions. And any classroom, whether you're tuning in live via YouTube or if you are on camera with us, take some pictures, post them to Twitter, tag EV Nautilus, tag at Nat Geo Education, and hashtag Explore Classroom. We love to see pictures of classrooms in action. All right, so as I said, we're heading on board Dr. Bob Ballard's exploration vessel Nautilus. The Nautilus is a 64 meter ship on a mission to explore the never before explored areas of the ocean and seek out new discoveries. And these can always be found live when the remotely operated vehicles are in the water at www.nautiluslive.org. The ship is currently in transit to their first ROV dive of this current expedition at Gorda Ridge along the coast of California and Oregon. And we are pretty lucky to be joined today by Sam Wishnack, who's the communications manager for the Ocean Exploration Trust and Dr. Darlene Lim of NASA's Ames Research Center. So it's so great to have both of you joining us. We've got awesome classrooms hanging out. We're excited to learn about the expedition and then we'll get some questions when the time is ready. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. And hello, everyone from Exploration Vessel Nautilus. As, uh, as Joe mentioned, I'm Samantha Wishnack, Communications Manager for the Ocean Exploration Trust. And with me today, Dr. Darlene Lim. That's me. You can just call me Darlene. I'm actually based at the NASA Ames Research Center, and I'm the PI or Principal Investigator of Subsea, which is the project that we're working on that Samantha will start us off learning about this incredible endeavor. Yeah, so as Joe mentioned, we are aboard Exploration Vessel Nautilus, and we want to show you a few slides just to get you set up with where we are and what kind of tools and technology we're using. And then I'll throw it over to Darlene for a little bit more about the subsea research program that we're undertaking right now. It's a really cool combination of ocean exploration plus space exploration. So let's get you started. We're going to share our screen here. Here we go. So you should be seeing now, whoop, you should be seeing now, uh, Exploration Vessel Nautilus. Uh, we had it for a second, Sam. Um, try, okay, let's try it again. Instead of the application window, use the option for the whole screen. That tends to work better. How's that? Uh, good, we got a full screen now. Perfect. So there's Exploration Vessel Nautilus. As Joe mentioned, it's 64 meters long, and we have space on board for uh, 48 people. So that includes all of our scientists and engineers, as well as the engine room team and the captain and officers on the bridge who are making sure we're headed in the right direction. And that even includes our cooks and steward who actually make sure that we're all well fed and taken care of on the ship. Uh, when we go out to explore, sometimes we actually have to create our own maps of the areas that we're going to. So we create our own seafloor maps here uh, using a multi-beam sonar system. So we're sending pulses of sound, so pings of sound down to the seafloor. And when they bounce back up to the ship, we're able to determine what the seafloor uh, depth looks like and a little bit of the terrain. So we're creating these uh, underwater terrain maps called bathymetric maps. So with those maps, we're actually able to plan our exploration with remotely operated vehicles, ROVs. So uh, meet Hercules and Argus. These are our two ROVs that are our eyes in the sea. So Hercules has a big HD camera on the very front and then two manipulator arms, which it uses to interact with the environment. So with Hercules, we can actually uh, interact by taking a rock sample or a coral sample and bringing it back on board the vehicle and back up to the ship where our scientists can then study those samples. 
Uh, behind Hercules there is Argus, and Argus actually floats above Hercules in between Hercules and Nautilus uh, to act as an eye in the sky camera view. So those two ROVs always work together uh, so that we're able to explore the deep sea floor. Putting that all together, there's Hercules at the very bottom checking out uh, octopus near hydrothermal vents. Uh, Hercules and Argus are connected to Nautilus via a fiber optic cable. So it's like a really long USB cable uh, that is then sending out that video signal from both uh, ROVs to our control van where our team sits and uh, monitors uh, the, the dive and the exploration and then sends that signal all the way around the world uh, via satellite. So it actually bounces down in Rhode Island and then goes out to around the world. So you all can watch from your classrooms and homes. So as I mentioned, there's the control van. So that's where uh, Darlene and I will be sitting uh, tomorrow when our, we start our first ROV dive. That's where Joe has sat as well in the past. So that's our whole team in there. It includes navigators, ROV pilots, video engineers, science communication fellows who are teachers that we bring out to help tell the story of exploration data loggers, scientists, and a lot of students who come out as interns as well. So uh, in a couple of years, more years for some of you, uh, you could actually come out here on Nautilus as a student. So more information about all those different roles of uh, the, the team on board are actually available at that website, nautiluslive.org that Joe mentioned. Uh, when we start our ROV dive, you can go to our website and actually watch the expedition live, watch the same thing our scientists are watching both on the ship, but then also back at shore. We actually have scientists who watch as kind of doctors on call in case we find something that we don't know uh, anything about. So you can see who's on duty, whose voices you can hear, and then also send in questions to our team in the van, and we can actually answer your questions live. So uh, as we mentioned, we are actually just starting our 2019 expedition season on Nautilus. We are currently on the way to Gorda Ridge, which is at the very top of this map. So we are just starting our season and we are going to be covering a lot of the Pacific Ocean. We're going all the way south to American Samoa, which is still technically part of the US, but very, very, very far away. It's actually just north of New Zealand. So I'd like to throw the floor over to Darlene to tell you a little bit more of why we're going to Gorda Ridge, what a special place this is, and what a unique program Subsea is. Sounds great. Thanks, Samantha. So Subsea is what's called an analog mission project. So what we do um, as part of NASA is we try and prepare ourselves for future missions, whether they're robotic missions or they're human missions or both, to different locations in our solar system. And um, one of the things that we do to to essentially get ready and to reduce the risk of these missions is we look for places on the Earth that offer up some sort of point of comparison to the different planetary locations that we're interested in. So when it comes to the deep sea, we know that in fact there are other planetary targets in our solar system, such as Enceladus, which is, the moon of, which is a moon of Saturn, as well as Europa, a moon of Jupiter, that actually have vast oceans. And one of the other things that we know about these two different targets is that in fact, there probably is what's called hydrothermal systems or active venting that's happening in the deep ocean of these two um, of these two moons. And if that's the case, then in fact, there may be the possibility of microbial life and maybe even more diverse life on these two different planetary systems. So we can't get there just yet. And there are missions that are being planned, um, robotic missions that are being planned by NASA um, to actually head out to these different locations to investigate these oceans more thoroughly than we have been able to thus far. So what we're doing in the meantime, again, to reduce risk, to get ourselves ready for these missions, is heading into our own Earth's oceans, which you just heard from Samantha is actually not that well characterized, not that well explored to date anyways. So last year we went to a place called Loihi, which is a volcanic seamount um, just off the coast of the big island of Hawaii. And we investigated that seamount, that, um, or pardon me, that um, an underwater volcano as an opportunity to understand these hydrothermal systems on Earth as they might actually help us understand other hydrothermal systems in our solar system. Um, and so the other cool thing about our project is we're not only just focused on the science and how that might offer us a great experiment and an experimental setting for places like Enceladus or Europa, but we're also interested in the entire mission itself. So as you, as you heard from Samantha earlier on, we actually send the video um, data, we send the um, other data from the ship, such as what you're seeing in front of you right now, which is um, 
you know, there's there's actually water that we will suck up into the ROV itself using these these things called a super, which is basically a wand that we can put into these very tight places and then actually extract water from these areas and then carry them back to the surface where we can analyze them. So all of that interesting research that's being done um, that we gather up here on the ship, any data that we can actually send back to shore, we do. And that whole process is called telepresence. And that is actually a really cool thing for us to study when it comes um, to understanding how humans might actually explore a solar system themselves. So many of you sitting in your classrooms um, might be interested in Mars exploration. So heading, having humans go to Mars is something that will probably start happening in the 2030s. And um, as that happens, we need to figure out how to, how to actually keep the humans safe and also how to help them do research in these very interesting um, environments on Mars. So we're actually using the ship and the way that we do research on the ship through this telepresence of having scientists sit on the shore and interact with us on the ship in a variety of different ways as a means to learn about how to do exploration in the future with humans as they head back to the moon in 2024 or around that time frame, and then onwards to Mars in the 2030s and 2040s. Um, so there's a lot going on on this ship. We also have a technology group that's actually looking um, to understand how best to support all of this uh, data transaction, these, the data going back and forth and how, stu how students like, like you, but graduate students interact with this information as well as other scientists um, and try and make their lives as simple as possible as all this information comes back. So there's a, there, there are a number of different research programs that are going on within this broader umbrella of what's called SUBSEA, and it's all funded by NASA, and then there's also support from NOAA, and then from the Ocean Exploration uh, Group here, um, o Ocean Exploration Trust Group here, um, and then on shore. So it's really been an amazing partnership over time. So I'll stop there, and we can talk about other things. Um, go, yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think um, we're all set to take your questions. We are hopefully now back to us and we've left screen share. We've got you both front and center. All Great. right. So we're happy to take questions about uh, the subsea research program, about life on Nautilus, about where we're headed next. Uh, any questions that you have? All right, very cool. Well, Darlene, I want to ask you a quick question before we move to the classrooms and your experience out uh, on the ocean. Is this, how many cruises have you been out now? Uh, doing this kind of work, this, is this my, kind of research. Yeah, this is my second cruise with uh, with OET on the Nautilus. I've been out before doing a lot of um, aquatic research, both both on the ocean and on freshwater, on lakes actually, and lake systems. But typically when we go out, or when I've in the past gone out, you go out for the day and then you come back in the evening on land. In this circumstance, you know, I'm, we're living on the 64 uh, meter long ship uh, the whole time. So we can't get off, and so it's a very different experience. I actually love it. There's nothing like that moment where you push off from port and you know that your adventure has started. It never, ever grows old, and uh, it is really a remarkable and glorious feeling. All right, really cool. Well, for any of those students out there who have that passion for the ocean, but for space as well, this is a really cool way that they could bring the two together uh, for some future research, some future projects. So really awesome to be able to connect uh, and to share this really exciting expedition. So let's get to some of those students. Let's meet some of those live classrooms. Let's see. Why don't we go to San Antonio, Texas first? Uh, Mrs. Goff is there. She's hanging out with some third graders. Let me get their microphone turned on. We'll find out how they're doing. How are we doing, third graders? All right. Lots of third graders. Very cool. What kinds of things have you... Um, discovered recently what kind of things have we discovered recently wow why don't you start oh, with uh, yeah <laughs> and then i can as you've discovered so much already on sure this yeah. so uh this is actually just the very 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 beginning of our 2019 expedition so uh nothing yet so far but as i said you can actually watch along with us as we make discoveries in real time um, but I can tell you that last year, we actually, uh, in the last couple of years, we found a few new sponge and coral species. So uh, you think about coral reefs, maybe you've seen them in Finding Nemo, uh, but coral reefs can also be found in the very, very deep sea where there is no light. And so there are these amazing, huge corals, bigger than we are, bigger than this room, uh, and sponges that we found in the deep sea that uh, we've actually been able to take samples of. And then a year or two, even more, uh, Months later, we actually find out our new species. So that's something that's happening a lot. 
almost every time we go down to the deep sea and look at these coral reefs, we find a new, a new species. But Darlene, what about some of the findings from last year? Yeah. So last year when we were at Loihi, it was just after the major eruptions that were happening on land, the Kilauea volcano and the whole area there was erupting very violently. We got there just after it started to sort of peter out. So we were really curious about, you know, investigating Loihi, which is this underwater volcano, which is connected, we think, to this to the land-based eruptions. Um, and we were curious to look at it in terms of the science that we just wanted to do, as I described to you, as an analog to Enceladus in Europa, but also to know, like, what happened to that whole eruptive system while this craziness was going on on land? And in fact, um, the vents that we expected to find, they were still there. And then we found actually other vents closer up to shore that was also very interesting. And so. All of these systems are what are called dynamic systems. They're constantly shape, you know, changing and shaping the land, shaping the underwater landscape everywhere. Um, and so that was really fascinating to, to go in and have a chance to take a look at just after this major um, activity on land itself. All right, very so, cool. And also, oh, sorry, go ahead. So cool that you guys are all in third grade. I have a third grader too. And so um, this is so exciting for me to, to see so many third graders out there in, you know, involved and interested in this. Great. All right. Awesome. Well, let's take another trip now. Let's go to Elkhart, Indiana this time. You have some fourth graders hanging out with Mrs. Borden's group. Let me get their microphone turned on. Where are they hiding? There they are. How are we doing, fourth graders? What is your most interesting creature you found yet? Most interesting creature. Most interesting creature. Uh-oh. Uh, I'm going to have to say it's actually the googly-eyed stubby <laughs> squid. And you know what? I'm going to take us on a little tour of our studio here because I want to show you this critter. We actually have it on our wall, but with some fake eyes. So here we go. We're going to go on a little tour of our studio. <laughs> here we go. So there's the googly-eyed squid. <laughs> now, those are some fake eyes on it, but you can see the real one next to it. And this little critter was found off of Southern California, so near Los Angeles. And when we saw it, we could not believe our eyes because <laughs> it doesn't look real. It looks like a toy, right? Um, and our science team could, could not... <laughs> could not guess what it was. Was it a squid? Was it a cuttlefish? Was it an octopus? Um, and, and if you go on to Nautilus Live and watch that clip, it's really fun to watch because we're all completely startled. It was about two or three o'clock in the morning. And so we also hadn't had much to sleep or much sleep. Uh, so that was one of my favorites that we found. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> all right. Very cool. Uh, let's see. Where should we go next? Let's go to some more fourth graders. They're hanging out with Mrs. Patton. They're in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, North Carolina? All right, who's up? Looks like the camera went off, but that's okay. We can still hear you. All right, we have a question from Keaton. Why do y'all call your big, why do y'all call your big machine Hercules? We didn't get that question. Can you repeat? Why do you call your big machine Hercules? Oh, why'd you call the big machine Hercules? Oh, yeah, yeah great question. <laughs> that is a great question. So uh, our founder, Dr. Ballard, uh, was was really interested in Greek mythology. And so in, in Greek mythology, Hercules is the big strong man. Uh, and if you if you look at Hercules, he's got two big manipulator arms um, that is that are very, very strong and that help us interact with the, the seafloor environment. So we can actually, with that big arm, to break off pieces of rock that you would never be able to do with a human hand or um, with a with a smaller tool. So Hercules is big and strong. And then Argus, the other uh, robot, the other ROV, is named after a, a kind of all-seeing god uh, in Greek mythology. So that's a great question. All right. Well, I want to check in with Mrs. Gray's class. There's some high school students, and I know they have a transition soon. Uh, and another class will join us. But they are in uh, Bellevue, Washington. Let me get their microphone turned on and see if they have a... A question for us. Oh, sorry. Hi. 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 Hello. Okay. So, my question is, what what do you guys think is the best way to tone down ocean pollution? Oh, great question. That is a great question. Do you have like three or four more hours? Yeah. <laughs> 
So, um, yeah, I, I think for us, you know, we're kind of on the receiving end. So um, we can certainly tell you that even in the deep sea, when we're three to 4,000 meters, that's, you know, 12,000 feet below the surface of the water, all the way on the seafloor, we still find plastic pollution. Uh, we find plastic bags or soda cans. Um, so there's no place on earth now that doesn't have that kind of issue. Uh, the, the problem is, as you pointed out, is huge, right? How do you solve a, an issue like that? Um, and I think it's really limiting it at the source. Uh, cleanup is really, really tough. We actually, when we're when we're diving with the ROVs, it's very difficult to pick up pieces of trash because we only have limited space on board. Um, and we're, that, that space is reserved for samples. So cleanup is cleanup at the end is not a not an option. So it's really a matter of reducing it, uh, you know, on land, reducing what you use, uh, recycling what you use, um, but trying to reuse or, or reduce at the source. Yeah, I agree. Well, and I'll tell you guys this because you know you're in high school, and you're on you're you're just at the cusp of kind of getting on your way and finding your interest. And I think it's very important for you guys to be as thoughtful as possible about the question that you put forward and not be reactive. Okay. So a plastic bottle unto itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Like plastics were invented and they've served very many positive roles in, in a lot of different positive outputs. But what's happened is we have so much plastic now that's getting consumed in general and then just discard it very quickly. And plastics aren't just in bottles, they're in our clothes, they're in all sorts of things that you come into contact with day to day, right? We just, we just can, we imagine immediately the plastic bag, the plastic bottle, because it's there, it's always around us everywhere in the world, but it's actually in a lot of different things that you come into contact with every moment of your lives. So be very thoughtful about this. Again, it's not a polarized, it's, it's not meant to be a polarizing thing. It's not black or white, but there are different um, ways that we can start to examine the problem as Samantha was saying about what do we actually consume that is plastic and do we actually need to consume that as a plastic? Can some other thing be used in its stead? Can we recycle the plastics and, re and if we need the plastic material in our clothes, then can we actually use what's already out there, that's what, what's been consumed and then put that back into the system so we're not introducing more into the system in general? And then of course there's a whole cleanup aspect of it and, and I think we need to consider the, the macro down to the micro or you know scale cleanup and what does that involve and support the research that that's helping us understand what is actually already in our environment and what can we reduce and move away from the environment and then the question is where do you put all that stuff like you, do you just gather it up and put it in another place which doesn't really solve the problem so that's what I mean by being very thoughtful about it and I think um, a lot of times in the media you're going to see this you're going to, you're going to see this problem as you see many other things such as climate change presented to you in a way which is very reactive and then forces out other emotional reactions. And that's not actually all that helpful right now in solving problems. You guys need to keep cool, stay cool, and just think everything through step by step and understand that there isn't a good or bad. There is just a situation that we need to move through and that you guys need to help improve. All right. Absolutely. And when you get into college, check out our internships for science and engineering so you can help us out here trying to solve some of these problems. <laughs> All right, awesome question and a great way to answer a very challenging uh, issue that, especially our high school students, uh, you guys are on the front line of being able to think of some of those solutions and enact some of those solutions. Yeah. Uh, let's see, San Antonio, Texas, we're going back. Mr. Schaefer's class, grade fours. Let's get that microphone turned on. You'll have to do it for me with uh, the iPad, Mr. Schaefer, and then give us a big shout out and we'd love a question. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Hey, four. Oh, we had you. Hey, fourth graders. Are we in? We got gotcha. you. Okay, good. Hello. Okay, we have a question. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hey, have you had any problems with the um, Hercules? Run from ah, do we run into problems? Yeah. So, turns out, um, if you've ever had a computer or a phone and you drop it into water, things don't <laughs> go so well, right? <laughs> so we're doing that every single day with Hercules and Argus. These are very, very advanced computers. They're robots, and they go in the water. So as you can imagine, with thousands of pieces making up one of these robots, something's going to go wrong pretty much every time we put it in the water. Um, and the interesting thing is that. We have a limited, you know, we have 48 people on board, but everyone has a different job. And so the people who come on board to be our ROV pilots, 
actually are not only the pilots, they're not only driving the vehicles, but they're also the mechanics. So they have to be able to fix anything on that vehicle um, because there's not a hardware store nearby that we can stop at. So we have to start our expeditions with every single tool uh, that we need or that we can think that we might need uh, in repairing some of these items. But sometimes you'll actually see us use duct tape or uh, zip ties, a lot of the, the kind of basic things uh, and get a little creative with it. That's a great question. All right, awesome question. Uh, let's go to Toronto, Ontario this time. Uh, Mrs. Wong has some um, sixth graders hanging out with her. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Toronto? Good. 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 Go Raptors. Raptors. Yay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I lived in Toronto for 10 years. I'm from Canada originally, so I'm pretty stoked. But now I'm in the Bay Area and we have the Warriors. So, oh my goodness, my house is going to be crazy. <laughs> Loyalties are torn. Go ahead with your question. So you said that the water vents at the bottom of our ocean may be similar to some at the bottom of the oceans in moon, like moons and in other planets. Do you think that the life yeah. moving around these water vents would be similar in, on other planets and moons? That's a, that's a possibility. So we don't know. So one of the reasons, that's an awesome question. I'm gonna just back out of there a little bit. So the, reasons why, the reason why we go to these vents is because we know there are events. That's like a box that you can check. There's a one-to-one -one correlation. We know there are events as an example on Enceladus. We have evidence of it. It's actually spewed out into the, into the um, outer atmosphere and, uh, or pardon me, out past the, the, um, the ice interface on Enceladus. And then it's actually created these these plumes or these geysers that we've actually flown through in space and gathered up information on. So we kind of know a little bit about the chemistry of what of what's happening down lower in Enceladus. Um, so that means you can go and you can find a vent on Earth and you can say, OK, so long as I'm within certain temperature parameters, certain pH, I'm probably finding an environment which is fairly similar to what you are. We, we, we could find on Enceladus. Now on Earth, we're going to think about all the unknowns that we we have lined up on Enceladus, things like we don't actually know how those 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 um, hydrothermal systems, those vents, are actually getting produced. What type of water and rock interactions may be happening that's producing those vents? What type of chemistry may be may be actually um, active in that area? And then, so we can find areas on Earth, such as Loihi, such as Gorda Ridge, with, which offer us an opportunity to sort of think those problems through a little bit and figure out what type of water rock interactions are happening in the vents on Earth, what type of energy is actually flowing through the system, and what, and then we have a whole team here that's looking at the microbiology. So that's why we're slurping up the water because they're gonna actually look at what's inside the water and then figure out what they're actually living off of when it comes to the, um, the energy in the system. And then from there, they can then say, okay, well, because I found this in this environment, which I think is pretty similar to what we might find on Enceladus, there is a possibility that this type of life could also be found on Enceladus. And then the impact of that statement would then be, well, then we have to go design the right robotic systems in order to detect that kind of life. So, so every time somebody makes, makes a statement that they think that they found some sort of a one-to-one -one correlation between what we uh, see on Earth and what we expect to see somewhere else in our solar system, then that has a trickle down effect all the way to the engineers who are trying to design the systems in order to be able to detect what we suspect we might find elsewhere. So it's, in, it's an incredibly um, complicated process to get to the net result, but there's lots of people involved who, who try and answer that um, ultimate question of how do we detect life elsewhere in our solar system. All right, what that a answers question. your question. No, that was a great question. And uh, wow, that'd be so exciting. If uh, if and when we make that big discovery sometime in the future, that's gonna be pretty wild uh, <laughs> to be able to say that, that we're not alone, we be pretty cool. All right, let's take a trip to uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. So we have a mixture of students hanging out with Mrs. Rosenberg. Uh, the mic wasn't working before, but they have an external one put in. So let's give it a test. How are we doing, New Jersey? Oh, Mrs. Rosenberg, I'm not sure the mic is uh, is cooperating. Do you wanna just type some questions in the blue chat sidebar and I'll keep an eye out uh, for them and work them in? All right. So while we wait for, for a couple of questions to pop in there, we're gonna go over to Mrs. Dottie's group. They are in New Jersey as well, Flemington, New Jersey, some fifth graders. 
Let's get that microphone turned on, see how they're doing. How are we doing, fifth graders? Hi! Hi. Good. <laughs> Um, how old is the ship and how many miles is the journey? Ooh, how old is the ship and how many miles has it gone? Was that the question? Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Oof, that's going to be a good one. Uh, the ship actually, Nautilus was built in 1967 all the way in Eastern Germany. So it actually started life as a research vessel in a completely different part of the world. Um, and Ocean Exploration Trust uh, started working with the Nautilus in 2008 and kind of overhauled it into what it is today. So we've had it for about 10 years. Um, and in the 10 years that we've had it, it has started in the Mediterranean, looking at shipwrecks in the Mediterranean, and went down along the Atlantic into the uh, Caribbean Sea, looking again at shipwrecks and uh, warm water communities there, uh, to Puerto Rico, into the Gulf of Mexico, so uh, off of Texas and Louisiana, and then actually went through the Panama Canal in 2015 and has been on the west coast of the U.S. all the way from up in British Columbia, Canada, all the way down into Mexico for the last uh, four years now. So I can't give you a number on how many miles. We're going to have to look that one up for you. But I can tell you that just in the 10 years that uh, Nautilus has been called the Nautilus and been working with the Ocean Exploration Trust, it has been all over the world. Uh, we haven't been down to Arctic, Antarctica, and we haven't been up to the Arctic yet, but otherwise we've, we're almost around uh, the, the whole world there. So that is a fantastic question that we're going to have to find an answer for you. All right, fair enough. Uh, Mrs. Rosenberg sent me in a question here. So what, on an expedition, uh, and I guess this will probably depend as well how deep you are, but they're wondering how long it takes to get the, the ROVs to the ocean floor and back to the ship. So we're going to be operating um, at about 2,800 meters, and it'll take us about three hours to get down to the to the bottom. Um, it gets it's harder to go down than it is, or it takes longer to go down than it does to come up. Um, but it takes a while. So fortunately, it's not like you just drop in and then you're there. Um, it's very different than say operating on land um, in terms of the time it takes sometimes to get to the location that you want to get to. All right, great question. Well, we still have some time, so let's visit a few more of our classrooms again. Um, why don't we do it this way? If you have a, class, a question in your classroom that you're just burning to ask, give me a big wave in front of the camera so I know to come back to your classroom. All right, well, one. I am seeing a ton of waving in Mrs. Goff's class. <laughs> we should probably start there. <laughs> Come back, come back. I want to do mine. You got to be like on the camera. You guys have a question ready? We're ready for you. He's trying to get on camera. Look at All right. Say hi, Donovan. Say hi. Hold this. This is Donovan. Hi, Donovan. Hi. What do you usually do when when there is nothing going on on the ship? <laughs> That's a great question. Can I start? Sure. I find there's never nothing going on on the ship. Um, because even though we're in transit right now, there's lots of um, prep preparations that we have to do in order to get ready for when we actually start our dives. Um, so there are a lot of people that are working on the ROV to make sure it's it's solid, that all the equipment is there. There are people in the microbiology lab that are prepping all their samples and all their test tubes and all the other chemical equipment that they need to to deal with the samples as they come up. and and that's kind of ditto in all the different labs right now. And then um, we have people that are running the expedition in general, like Samantha, who's constantly thinking about all the next interactions um, in terms of the outreach and education. And then there's the expedition lead who's always on her toes. She's always watching um, for weather that's coming in, for swells, um, trying to understand all, you know, if everything is functioning on the ship, dealing with meetings with the captain, with the crew, uh, with me. And um, so there's just constant activity and so it's you never feel like you, you never feel bored or at least you shouldn't because then you, you're probably not doing your job <laughs> <laughs> yeah and if you do have any free time there's a gym on board so you can work out um there's a lounge with movies uh and then around three o'clock every day we have snack time when some cakes I or i forgot uh... <laughs> about snack time the cooks make the crazy yummiest cakes and cookies like yeah, it's like the best. So there are little pockets of free time in our day. <laughs> yes, I forgot. Yes, we do. <laughs> and everybody's very nice on these ships. I think it's 
Um, when you're on these types of expeditions, whether it's on, at sea or on land, you generally find that that it attracts a certain type of person who's pretty easygoing, who gets along, who can kind of battle through tough situations and is really good at teamwork. Um, so <clears throat> I, I love that about, about these expeditions, meet some amazing people. All right. Well, I have to second that cook thing. I, I didn't know what to expect when I was on board for the, the period of time. <laughs> the food was incredible every single day. I don't know where they kept it all. Well, actually, I do because I did a supply chain one time and there was a lot of food loaded onto the ship. So then I understood. <laughs> all right. Uh, where should we go next? Oh, man, lots of waving. Well, let's start off in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, um, how deep can the um, ship dive like or travel like is there any limit to like how much it can travel into the ocean yeah that's a great question so the rovs hercules and argus uh they do have depth limits and those limits are set because if it goes any deeper com different components on board the vehicle might actually explode from the pressure so uh hercules and argus actually have two different limits hercules can go down to uh 4, meters depth and Argus can go down to 6,000 meters depth, but they are always travel together. So we're always sticking around just above 4,000 to keep in that safe range. Full ocean depth of the ocean is 10,000 meters. So these two vehicles can go just about half. Um, but if you, if you wanna do a little extra work after this, uh, check out maybe online some of the other vehicles that can go down to that depth and just compare and look at them and see the different shapes and the different uh, structures that are involved to go to that extra depth kind of interesting to compare uh, the different engineering challenges that that come up when you try to go all the way down to the bottom of the seafloor that's a great question all right where should we go next oh we gotta go mrs gray's class we're going back to washington hi uh so i'm asking for a couple friends so this question will probably have two parts um one is that has anyone on your ship ever studied chemosynthesis and then second Ooh. is do you ever just jump off the ship to swim and dive just for exercise or fun? <laughs> I'm gonna answer the second I'll, one. I'll take the second one and yeah. throw it back to Darlene. Uh, second one, uh, swim calls, no, we do not have swim calls where we're able to jump off the ship. Uh, currently, we're also off the coast of Northern California and it is cold. It's gonna be anywhere from 40 to 50 degrees in the water. So I'm okay not swimming anytime soon. Yeah, me too, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, to chemo chemosynthesis, um, that is actually the focus of a good part of our science team, Everett Schock's group, as well as um, Julie Huber's group at Woods Hole, um, the two of them together. And then also the, the group at um, Idaho State University looking at the, the geology. So looking at, under, trying to understand chemosynthesis in the um, deep oceans, which is, which is trying to understand the movement of, of different type of elements through um, these vent systems as an example and how they might impact life um, and how life has taken advantage of these different circulation systems. Uh, it takes a lot of different groups that have to come together and kind of look at the problem from a variety of different angles. So that's why our science teams get pretty diverse. Um, and it's not just like one person or one you know team that kind of looks at this problem. You need to really have a, a bevy of different um, experts that come together and then work in an inter interdisciplinary manner in order to really understand um, uh, the, the, the question of how life survives in these very extreme environments. All right, uh, I'm gonna check with Mrs. Patton's class because their camera's not working, so it's not fair. They might not be able to wait. Let's check in. Oh, wow. a question, Ms. Patton's group. Okay, we have a question right here. Her name's Ileana. Uh, do you guys ever get seasick? Huh. Ah, that's a relevant question. Well, you can see us. We're kind of moving around out here right now. <laughs> so we we just left port yesterday. And um, so actually, as we're talking to you, both Samantha and I are quite sick. <laughs> so we're doing Ooh, our best. Yeah. I'm realizing I'm not saying things as clearly as I would normally and probably not as precise. And it's fundamentally, I'm feeling quite ill. So yeah. yes, yes, we do get <laughs> sick. And it, it's different for all people. So some people, uh, you know, just get really sleepy. I get really sleepy. So after this, I'll probably go have a nap before lunch. Yeah. Uh, but we do find that within a two or three days, your body kind of resets itself. You yeah. just need a couple good nights sleep and you're usually all set. Yeah. All right. Mrs. Schaefer's class in San Antonio. Do you want to turn the mic on for us? Okay. 
Are we in? Are we good? Oh, let's see. Yes, you're having some okay. tasty lunch, too. Roll out. What is the biggest creature you have ever discovered? Ooh. Ooh. Well, hopefully we'll eventually find a giant squid. So I'm going to leave that question for the future. But uh, uh, the biggest animal that we've seen on board Nautilus so far has actually been a sperm whale. It was a juvenile sperm whale, so it's still about 30 feet long. Uh, but it, w it came right up to ROV Hercules, right um, off of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico and scared the bejesus out of everyone on board the ship. Yeah, uh, if you can imagine coming out of the darkness, this big eye and just <laughs> the top of the square whale head. Uh, we first saw that and then it kind of turned in the water, kind of did a full circle, kind of looking at us like, what are you? <laughs> uh, so you can, you can watch that on the Nautilus Live website. It was a pretty incredible moment. All right, very cool. Well, unfortunately, time is flying, so we're not going to be able to do too many more questions. But I was wondering, uh, Sam, would awesome. sending some more questions and tagging EV Nautilus be an option for the classrooms? Sure, let's do it. We we like we said, we're in transit for another uh, you know day or so, so we've got plenty of time to answer those. All right, very cool. So classrooms, if on Twitter, if you tag at uh, EV Nautilus, you should be able to send some more questions uh, Nautilus's way. Uh, well, Darlene and Sam, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us today as your body adjusts to the new expedition. Uh, really cool to be able to learn a little bit about what's coming up over the next few weeks. And then classrooms, of course, you can go to knowledgelive.org uh, once the RVs hit the water. And Sam, when do you think that first uh, dive will happen? I think we're thinking Wednesday 4 a.m. <laughs> Wednesday 4 a.m. Yep. There we go. There, yep, there it is. All right. 4 a.m. Pacific time. So seven, well, all, all over for you, you all. Yeah. Yeah. All yep. right. Perfect. So during the day on Wednesday, if you tune in uh, to the website, you should be able to watch live here, the scientists and the RV pilots and the science communication fellows, everybody talking and working together uh, in that control van. It'll be really cool. Well, we're looking forward to another catch up. I believe we have another event scheduled for June 5th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So hopefully we'll get to hear a little bit more about how the expedition is going. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to turn all the microphones on, let the classrooms get really loud with a big, huge goodbye and thank you uh, to you guys for today. So here we go, classrooms. I'm turning your microphones on. Let's go nice and loud. <laughs> All right. They're always so good. They never let us down. Well, again, thanks, uh, Nautilus. We look forward to catching up later in June. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for exploring with us.